Hey Axis and Allies players, this is the good captain. Welcome to another video on Axis and Allies Classic. So today's video is going to be a little bit different. I'm actually going to try to do a session report so that this video is essentially going to be that from my tournament game that I played just last weekend at OrcCon. But there is a lesson I think that is worth imparting and it's repeatedly learned in this game. <laughs> and I figured I'd share it with you. It's, I call it Always Use a Battle Calculator. And if you're not interested in the session report and just want to hear or see the examples, check out the timestamps in the description box below. There are three examples. You can just jump to if you want to go straight to the key battles. For those who don't know, OrcCon is one of the three gaming conventions held at the Airport Hilton. Uh, near LAX every year, and the Axis and Allies tournament there is three games deep. Uh, the first game, uh, which occurs on Saturday morning, is any version of Axis and Allies, as long as your opponent agrees to play that version with you. If you win that game and move to round two, which is Saturday afternoon, you're usually playing either Pacific or Europe. And if you win that matchup, you get to come back on Sunday for the final, which is Global 1940. So, for the first time, I arrived on Saturday morning a little bit early to set up a uh, Milton Bradley 2nd edition version of the game. And I insisted on no bid, but in return, I offered my, any opponent who would take me on choice in sides. So of course someone in the group volunteered to take the allies, but before I sat down and started rolling dice with them I asked, on a scale of 1 to 10, how comfortable are you playing this version? And after he stated that he hadn't played it since the 80s and that he only really played Axis and Allies at the conventions, I only asked for Russia Restricted. On the right is the section of the manual that covers the five optional rules in Axis and Allies Classic 2nd Edition. And on the left is my um, Word document that helps delineate which rules are being used. Of course, number six, strict neutrals, is not located in the actual manual. If you want to understand why that's there, check out my the video that I uploaded just prior to this one. So now that you understand the layup, let's go look at the first few turns. So what we're looking at here is a camcorder video footage of the beginning of British turn one. And while my opponent's taking his turn here, we'll discuss briefly what's happened so far. Uh, the Russians have purchased eight infantry and then left one infantry in the Soviet Far East, two in Yakut, two in uh, the Novosibirsk, moving one tank there as well. Uh, we have 13 infantry in Karelia, and the rest of the infantry and armor and aircraft are in Russia, except for a blocker in the Caucasus. Of course, the Russian Navy moved over to the UK fleet, so fairly standard first turn uh, for the Russians. Now, the 13 infantry in uh, Karelia was a little bit interesting for me. As the German player, there is an option to attack there, but given that he had no air or armor units to destroy in that attack, I opted, of course, not to do that, and instead went with the tried and true uh, first turn attack with the Germans that I advocate for. If you don't know what I'm talking about, check out my Germany strategic video uh, released a little over a year ago now. So I copied that to a T and it was uh, pretty successful. Uh, I only lost one German infantry unit in Anglo-Egypt Sudan and uh, that's not really lucky. Uh, this is a, a fairly safe, uh, I'll go ahead and pause this video here. That's a fairly safe move for the Germans to do. Uh, 
the biggest risk is the fighter versus the transport off the east coast of Canada, but I got away with it in this game, preserving all five fighters. So, when my opponent began his turn, um, and I built ten infantry and placed them in Germany, uh, you can see them stacked up right here. Uh, notice, crucially, uh, this will um, come up later, there are no troops in southern Europe. I, I, for some reason, convinced myself that that was unnecessary, but this will come back to bite me in the rear end in a, in a moment. So, uh, I saved the other uh, uh, two IPCs. So, 10 infantry and save two. Now, Britain's going here right now, and what Britain did was purchase one industry, one transport, and two infantry. You can see his builds off the left side of the screen here. Now, he just took his combat move. He's using his bomber to attack the sub in the Mediterranean there, and his two fighters are going for my submarine and transport south of Norway. So this is a very standard first turn move. And he also uh, moved Brit two British infantry into Algeria, so he did a British version of Operation Torch on B1. And that was it. That was all the offensive action he took. The result uh, was that he moved, or that he was successful in both battles completely. Lost no aircraft. The sub did not escape. He moved one fighter back to Britain here. One fighter moved to the Caucasus. And the bomber moved to the Caucasus as well. But I think I summarized it best at my end of turn one summary here. Quick turn one recap. So here, here's how Russia took its first turn in the non-combat movement phase. In the German turn, the Axis uh, did my I did my standard move in invading Egypt, and uh, yeah, everything went about uh, as well as it could have. Lost one infantry in Anglo Egypt, Sudan. On the British turn, uh, they moved their battleship and transport down and did a little torch in Ang and Algeria, building one infantry and one transport uh, and one industry down in South Africa. And this is the way it ended up elsewhere for Britain. Uh, and then in Japan's turn, I uh, hit China. I lost two infantry on the attack uh, after destroying the Americans there. non commed four fighters into Manchuria and put one on the carrier. And that's how we ended up here. And then uh, the Americans built three subs to transport and infantry. They consolidated their fleet in Hawaii, reinforced the British in Algeria, and built a sub and a transport over here. Uh, and an infantry and built two more submarines off the west coast. Turn two. Okay. So the beginning of turn two saw the Russians attack the Ukraine SSR. No surprise there. My blocker failed to score any hits. And a, a substantially large Russian army hit Finland, Norway, and secured it after the loss of one, uh, one troop. So nothing surprising there, but I am a little concerned. The Russians did collect 29 IPCs on this turn. So next up was, of course, Germany. And on Germany's turn, I decided to take, with my 37 IPCs, I decided to spend all of it on infantry save one, so that's where you get these 12 infantry in the compass rows here. Uh, and after studying the battlefield for uh, quite some time, I'd say about five to ten minutes, I decided to go south. The reason I had spent so much time making this decision was because I had a very lucrative option of hitting Algeria uh, in conjunction with the Luftwaffe and the Mediterranean fleet, wiping out American, British ground units and American air units. But I decided to go south because uh, one of the adages that I operate under is to always try to expand the Axis IPCs at the beginning of the game. And since there was three so close and so easy for Germany to attain uh, in this uh, core of Africa here, uh, I decided to go south. And alternatively, I would send my Luftwaffe, every plane I had, uh, all five fighters and bomber, 
against this British and American and Russian fleet off the west coast of Western Europe. And finally, we come to the first battle calculator error, the, or lack thereof. Um, I used a battle calculator in the um, air battle with the naval units to make sure that I wasn't really in danger of losing more than one fighter. But what I'm doing right now is where I failed to account for uh, Russian counterattack option. Right now, I have 11 troops and 5 tanks in Eastern Europe. And what I'm intending to do is move the entire force into the Ukraine SSR. So by quickly glancing at a battle calculator, I would be able to see that with 11 infantry, 5 tanks, and that AA gun after I moved it in there, on defense, the best the Russians could do is a 50-something percent chance odds of victory. So that's, I'm comfortable with that as the Axis player in this game. This is what you're looking for when you're pushing into Russia, forcing them to make high-risk attacks. You can't really get it better than this as the Germans, so this is okay. But due to the fact that I didn't battle calculate this, you're now watching me make an error. And what I'm doing is using my transport to load up two infantry, reducing the 11 to 9, I'm now realizing that I should have put two of my builds in Southern Europe, so this wouldn't be an issue at all. But I'm going ahead and doing it anyway, not realizing the mistake until too late. But those were my combat moves, so we'll see how we ended up. And here's how we ended up. Uh, we smashed the Allied fleet uh, for the loss of a single German fighter, as predicted. Um, in Africa, we secured the other side of the canal and these three other IPCs and the but the Russians managed to inflict two hits before they went down there's only two units there and they both scored hits so now I'm down to seven infantry five tanks and an AA gun and by this point I realized the danger and did pull out my battle calculator to realize that there was a 90 something percent chance the Russians would win a battle if they decided to commit their units against me. This coupled with the fact that the British built a second industry on their British turn 2, there I'm pointing it out and lamenting, I was not feeling, I'm starting to not feel so well. That and there is a successful British attack into Southeast Asia. So I was a little concerned at this point in the game. But I'll let uh, the good captain fill us in on turn two. Uh, turn two recap. Here we are with the IPC board. Um, the Russians started out by attacking the Ukraine and Finland uh, and took both. And so they collected a whopping 29 IPCs at the end of their second turn. The Germans then counterattacked with what you see there, although the Russian defenders made two hits. Uh, and uh, the German Air Force, every plane went at the Allied fleet off to the west and defeated them, uh, losing one plane in the process, uh, while the Germans just expanded out in Africa, taking what they could. Um, the battleship bombarded and um, we took Syria, Iraq. Uh, then the British turned, they actually attacked French Indochina and took it. Uh, for no loss, with two infantry there, and then they their builds they built up uh, some units here, placed two or brought two fighters down. And on Japan's turn, um, everything in China hit Xinjiang, everything in Manchuria hit uh, Yakut, and the Imperial Japanese Navy uh, hit French Indochina. I'll pause it here and say that I also occupied the Soviet Far East with the Japanese as well. You just see the Americans up there because on their turn they took it back. The Americans inflicted a single casualty before they went down, the Russians inflicted two hits before they went down, and so did the British, surprisingly. And so when the Americans went, they counterattacked and retook Soviet Far East. So this is the way the board looks at the end of turn two.
So, turn 3 opened with the expected Russian attack into the Ukraine SSR. Uh, luckily, I managed to bring down one Soviet fighter with the AA gun position therein. And I'll summarize that in two rounds of combat, my opponent managed to destroy all seven infantry and three out of five of my tanks for only the six infantry losses to his ground forces. He then decided to retreat rather than risk losing his tank army in the Ukraine SSR to a counterattack, he retreated back to the Caucasus. So, uh, this is how we ended up looking on the East Front after all was said and done. One small silver lining for me was that the Russians would not get Ukraine SSR and uh, would only collect 24. And in their non-combat movement phase, the Russians placed a screen of infantry facing east German combat move, I decided I needed to start being a little bit risky with my dice, and so uh, did attacks with my Luftwaffe everywhere. I sent the bomber, as you can see up here, to Karelia to strategic bombing, to do a strategic bombing raid. <coughs> I sent two of my fighters into French Equatorial Africa, along with one of my remaining German infantry, to try to clear it. Uh, I also sent my two remaining fighters, one each, to the transport, American transport west of uh, Western Europe and west of West Africa. There was a British transport, one went there as well. Uh, and as you can see, I pushed the Italian fleet into the Suez Canal. Uh, his AA gun missed, but I only did one IPC worth of damage with the industrial bombing raid. And I got diced in the rest of this turn. Uh, one of his transports took down one of my fighters for no loss to itself. His defending infantry in Africa took down my blocker, allowing him access to Egypt and basically all of Africa on his turn. And amazingly, the British transport in the Suez Canal would uh, take down my German transport with it. So by the end of this turn, this is the face of consternation um, and a feeling of this game is probably over, it's washing over me, all because of my mistake for not using a battle calculator. I'm thinking I'll do the best I can, but this game is probably over, especially since the British have correctly played their strategy with the two industrial complex build, uh, a build that is very highly effective at suffocating the, um, the Axis expansion, namely Japan. On the UK turn, it was a fairly uh, quiet uh, retake over of all of Africa. As you can see at the bottom of the screen here, they took over everything but my uh, small German bastion in Belgian Congo there. And uh, what you're seeing now is the top of Japan's turn one, but I'm just going to use this as a reference uh, for uh, Britain's turn. Uh, Britain reinforced India with three fighters, two infantry, a bomber, and there's an American infantry, infantry in there. This, of course, uh, needed to go down, so I was going to commit everything I could to the destruction of all units in India and the takeover of the Indian factory. However, I had to respect the fact that I needed to land bridge Japanese troops and tank off of Japan into Manchuria, so the balance of the combined fleet needed to head north, and the American fleet was threatening, along with reinforcing subs from Hawaii, I needed to take this into account too. This forced my purchase. That you can see here in the compass rows, two subs, one transport, and four infantry. This again, um, now that I have caught myself, I'm using a battle calculator for everything. And I've anticipated that if the Americans attack, that's the proper amount of naval units to screen my very valuable Japanese fleet. So the battle in India um, did not go totally well. I did end up taking it over, but I lost two out of the five of my fighters to secure it. The British rolled uh, pretty well throughout this game. And the American purchase, uh, when it came to America's turn, was an aircraft carrier, a fighter, and I believe another sub or a transport. No, I think it was just, a, oh, that's right, it was just an aircraft carrier and a fighter. And then the most inexplicable thing happened. The Americans decided to attack the combined fleet with three subs, one transport, 
a battleship, two fighters, and an aircraft carrier. Again, having used a battle calculator, I knew what the odds were. This was uh, almost certainly going to be a defeat for the Americans, and I knew that I would survive with roughly five units, preserving my battleships, aircraft carrier, and at least two of my transports, which is what I wanted to move those four infantry that I bought off of Japan. It all makes sense now, doesn't it? I couldn't believe he did it, but if you don't use a battle calculator, boys and girls, these are the types of errors you can make. <laughs> Here's uh, the battle after the Americans have done their damage and I'm halfway through doing mine. I've lost two transports and the Americans will end up losing all of their uh, naval units save for the battleship and they'll retain their air units when they retreat. So this is how the battle ended at the or end of round uh, three. I uh, saw the Americans much reduced in the Pacific, although the Japanese is still very much contained. Uh, on the Asian mainland. Round four would be even more interesting. On turn four, another inexplicable event happened. The Russians would utilize these two groups of 10 stack infantry the five tanks they had at their disposal and their remaining fighter to attack Eastern Europe, which had 22 infantry and five tanks. Here they are, all laid out on the battlefield or on the battle board. Excuse me. Now, for those of you who are wondering, 20 infantry, five tanks, and a fighter do not hold up well against 22 infantry, five tanks, and an anti-aircraft gun. The Russians had would have between a 12 and 18 percent chance of victory. Again, I weighed this with a battle calculator before setting up my defenses, but my opponent went after it anyway. With predictable results, here's a, a picture taken immediately after that battle, after the Russians retreated into Karelia to lick their wounds. This helped bring not only balance back to the board, but now I had a strong advantage. The Axis have regained the advantage now. And on Germany's turn four, I decided to purchase seven tanks for an immediate strike on the following turn into Karelia. It was now or never. I also decided to take East, uh, Ukraine SSR with the minimal amount of force and build up a massive army in Eastern Europe. In Africa, the remainder of the Africa Corps would strike northeast and hit Anglo-Egypt Sudan with everything it had. Meanwhile, the Italian battleship would head south to sink the British transport in the Union of South Africa and prevent the construction of, or not prevent the construction of new transports, but contest the construction of new transports in the south there. Interestingly, I was able to secure Egypt for one more turn with a tank remaining, flying the fighters off to Eastern Europe uh, to safety. The battleship, what did manage to destroy the transport, but the transport yet again sunk a German ship, this time my battleship. So, all German fleet units have been destroyed. But the damage at this point had been done, and I felt that I was on a clear path to victory after being so close to defeat. British turn passed uh, rather innocuously. The British did manage to retake, of course, Anglo-Egypt Sudan, but stopped short of Syria, Iraq. They reinforced the Russians in Karelia, now seeing the writing on the wall and desperate to avoid the inevitable. On the Japanese turn four, I send a single submarine to go deal with the U.S. battleship supported by the Japanese bomber. All other forces attack outwards and everywhere, striking the Soviet Far East with an armor and two infantry, uh, striking Yakut with four infantry and some fighter support. And I gambled and sent the Japanese tank in India against the Sinkyang uh, grouping of two Russian infantry. And the Japanese turn went well. We managed to sink the Japanese or American battleship for no loss, thanks to a surprise strike. 
both Russian territories were secure and the small Russian army in Xinjiang was destroyed. I placed three infantry in India to help secure it. And overall, this picture, the Axis picture on this side of the board as well started to look much, much better. For the American part, on turn four, they engaged in a very curious battle that had um, in interesting results. All three fighters were sent against a single Japanese submarine east of the Japan Sea Zone, and all three fighters missed. This created a very unique opportunity to utilize the submarine retreat rule. And I happily employed this rule and moved the, the ship to Hawaii, thereby blocking the ability of the, Pacific, the new Pacific Fleet to occupy this zone in the non-combat move. <laughs> Pretty clever, huh? Because of this move, the way was now paved for unopposed uh, landings in um, either e Australia or New Zealand with part of the combined fleet. So this is way, the way the board looked at the end of turn four. I failed to mention that on the American turn, a curious attack took place against India. The American Air Force used the bomber and the fighter to attack the three infantry and one fighter defending that territory. I didn't know it, and there was nothing I could do, but this was a setup. Apparently, the Russians weren't planning on defending their capital, or didn't know that the Germans would be able to crack Karelia. But on the Russian turn, the Russians attacked with four infantry and a fighter, and resecured India. That created a situation that the Japanese would, again, have to rectify in their next turn. Despite the Russians' best effort to re reinforce Karelia, the inevitable did happen, and Germany, with its vastly superior land army, crushed the Russians in Karelia. Now there was nothing to stop them from taking over Moscow the following turn. The British did the best they could by invading Eastern Europe and moving their African army uh, into Persia to threaten that area of the board as best they could there was little they could do to help the Russian capital. Curiously, despite advising my opponent that he could, he did not place any British units in India. The Japanese then did what they could and moved deeper into Asia, moving the combined fleet down to support. The Americans conducted a repeat of an operation they conducted earlier in the game putting pressure against the Japanese home islands and giving Soviet Far East back to the Russians. And despite their efforts, the Russians were unable to defend their capital at the top of turn six, or I should say the end of German turn six. This was the situation on the board. This was an Axis victory. So, what are the lessons learned in this game that I played at the tournament, well, first and foremost, is never underestimate your opponent. Uh, the whole reason I didn't use a battle calculator was because I was overvaluing my experience playing many, many, many games of classic second edition and evaluated my opponent as being somebody who probably didn't know exactly what they were doing, causing me to pass on using the battle calculator, which is the second big lesson learned always use a battle calculator because it can prevent the very thing that I just men mentioned and that I that is underestimating your opponent. If you use a battle calculator on pretty much any battle that has more than three or four pieces you will not be able to underestimate your opponent because the numbers will be staring you in the face. I also believe that your games will improve overall. You as a player will improve and your games will be longer and more enjoyable. So I really enjoyed my first uh, round at OrkCon uh, this year. It was a lot of fun. I have special thanks to my opponent. Um, and for those of you who are curious to know, uh, I did end up taking first place in this tournament. Uh, so a lot of fun. 
and if you're in the LA area, I highly recommend that you come out on Memorial Day or Labor Day weekend and uh, play a game. And maybe you and I could even play one together. Okay, thanks for watching this. All the best from the good captain, and bye-bye.